because you're sitting in a world right now that everyone is focused on price and no one is focused on value. It's the most interesting time in, I've, I've seen in um, financial markets. Welcome to the Path to Wealth, the show about well-being, fulfillment, and financial freedom. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Path to Wealth, where we interview professionals, entrepreneurs, and investors and be inspired by their unique journey. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi, and in this episode today, we will dive into alternative investments and portfolio management. We have the honor of interviewing one of the experts in this field, a certified financial analyst, charter holder, and the founder of Focused Capital, Chris Galicio. Chris has been a portfolio manager for almost three decades, previously serving Fidelity Investments for 10 years, managing at its peak 7 billion of large cap growth assets, including 1 billion for a well-known family office and Pioneer Investments for 13 years. Now he's the portfolio manager of Little Harbor Advisors focused on long short strategy. Chris also produced the movie Money Game, which will hit in November. And I think we're all very excited since there haven't been any good movies about Money Game. So I'm very curious to hear more about that, Chris. Thanks for coming today. And I'll start with one quote that kind of sets the stage for today's interview. And that's from Warren Buffett. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Hannes. Nice to see you. Um, I love your quote because you're sitting in a world right now that everyone is focused on price and no one is focused on value. It's the most interesting time in, I've, I've seen in um, financial markets. Um, so, yes, I made a movie called Money Game. Um, we finished the movie May 1. Um, we're hoping to get into the Toronto Film Festival. By um, The film um, submission is by, by, um, by May 12th, and we're hoping to be at Toronto uh, between... Uh, September 11th, 7th to 11th. Our opening quote in Money Game is this. The task is not to see what no one else sees, but to think what no one else has thought about that which everybody sees. We're seeing craziness in markets. You're th seeing things that don't make sense. You saw FTX collapse. We're seeing the banking crisis. We're seeing um, Tesla was trading at $2 trillion and losing money. Amazon was trading at $2 trillion and losing money. Um, GameStop, we, nobody goes to GameStop. Like we all buy our games online. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to explain all this craziness um, because we're all seeing it, um, but we don't understand why it's happening. The way we explained it in the movie, it's, it's the theme of the movie. Capitalism requires risk to allocate scarce resources. When you remove risk from a system, it changes the ecosystem. Think of what's happened. During COVID, there was $17 trillion in bonds with a negative yield. So when, when interest rates go negative, uh, the professor is going to say, I mean, we all know how simple finance is. Finance is the easiest subject in the world. It's all based on one formula, one divided by interest rate. In other words, if I give you $1 forever, what's it worth? The only statistic you need to know is the interest rate. If interest rates are 10%, it's $1. Divided by 10%, the value is $10. If interest rates fall to 1%, it's now $1 divided by 0.01%, it's $100. Then the professor in the movie is going to say, well, what happens when interest rates go negative? And the class is going to know. And he's going to say, well, if interest rates go negative, all assets are worth infinite. My coffee is worth infinite. My desk is worth infinite. My chalkboard is worth infinite. Does that make sense? So what we're trying to do is that show that the, the Fed played the money game. They drove interest rates down and asset prices up. When interest rates went to, um, to negative, the ecosystem changed. It shifted from, a, from capitalism, which rewards companies that, need, that make profit, to central planning, which, is companies, which rewards companies that need financing. And so you're seeing companies that need financing um, do extremely well. In, in Money Game, um, we're, we're basically trying to showcase with one of our best actors, Terrence McFadden Jr., who I think is basically just a young Leonardo DiCaprio. He's just a phenomenal actor. We're trying, he, he's the CEO of Tap It. Um, and you're going to see all the kids on their phone tapping their phone, right, which is hilarious um, because it's a movie. It has to be fun. Um, the, um, the A and the P of tap it, you guys can decide what you think that is. But that's the A and the P of T-A-P-I-T, -T, right? And so, um, so the, um, the villain in the movie is the CEO of tap it making billions of dollars. He's going to walk up to James, who's our lead character, who represents the real economy. So what we're doing is we're showing James represents the real economy and um, Bryson, Terrence McFadden Jr., represents the financial economy. So Bryson's going to be saying, listen, James, why do you think my company is trading at $10 billion? Why? It's me. Right. So we're trying to show the hubris of all these, um, these CEOs 
and um, that are making billions of dollars in their apps, not because they're making money, not because they're profitable, because interest rates went to negative and their stocks went to infinite. But understand what's also happening is money is shifting away from the real economy because we're not um, investing in these companies, we're financing them, So, um, so we, which, by the way, then slows the real economy. Because what people aren't noticing is the uh, we use we we're using the big five from the savannah um, to represent the ecosystem. So they're going to go to um, they're going to go to a concert and you're going to see cheetah coin. They're going to raise a coin uh, on CNBC. Say save the rhinos. It's a gold coin, right? They're talking about rhinos in the real world. We're talking about gold, right? The um, they're going to we're going to talk about wildebeest, which represent algorithms. Um, and they're going to say um, the uh, the Reddit guys finally figured out how to trigger the stampede of algorithms. Just aggregate a bunch of buyers. It's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Um, and then the professor says, bingo. Right? So we're showing the e ecosystem. The one thing you will never see in our movie is the elephant in the room, which is represented by our lead character, James, who's the real economy. And what people don't recognize is the real economy is not growing anymore. Um, in May of 2021, um, productivity hit a 75-year hit a low because the entire system is misallocating resources into FTX and Dogecoin and Amazon, all these companies will lose money. So the point is the system is broken um, because all the money is flowing to the rich at the expense of the poor. We all we have all heard that capitalism benefits everyone, but you're sitting in a system that 60% of the money has flowed to the rich, right? So the top 1% have 60% of the wealth because all the money floats, that, which isn't capitalism anymore. Anne Rand had a quote, capitalism with government intervention is the worst type of economic phenomenon. Why? Because it's not capitalism. It's central planning. It slows the real economy, misallocates resources. So the theme of money game, capitalism, requires risk to allocate scarce resources. The, um, the presser is going to um, <clears throat> talk about, during the movie, he'll talk about, um, in capitalism, interest rates represent risk. What would happen if I removed risk from capitalism? Um, and this class is going to say, I don't know. He's going to say, okay, well, what would happen if I removed the lions from the savannah? And one of the kids will say, well, the gazelle population would explode. Passive investing. Another student will say, but then they'll be competing for scarce water resources and die off. To which the professor says the biggest quote in the entire movie, correct. And when the Fed intervened in bond markets, they broke the ecosystem of capitalism. And that's what we're showing, that the ecosystem of capitalism is now broken. What do I mean by that? 85% of the market is now passive and quant. So 60% passive, 25% quant. That leaves only 15% active managers. So who's setting prices? There aren't enough lions left in the savannah to set prices. Now um, the ecosystem is broken and now, now the whole thing is just a, it's a mess. Now, why did the machines win? Why did the machines beat the humans? Because of moral hazard. Because machines have no morals. It's not because they're better allocators. It's because they have no morals. The, the machines saw Delhi in New Jersey trading at $10 million. And the humans looked and said, why would I pay a $10 million for a deli in New Jersey that loses $400,000 a year? Um, then interest rates went negative and the deli went to $115 million. I mean, that, that just shows you, um, that's just a one particular example, but at the same, but it's only, that's a small cap, but you can run that right through the entire system. GameStop went from 300 million to 20 billion. Um, Live Nation, um, during COVID, um, and we'll show this in the movie, when unemployment hit 33% and nobody went to concerts, Live Nation doubled from its peak, not from its bottom, but from its peak. So Live Nation, where their, where their, where their revenues went to zero because there were no concerts, doubled. Does this, not, nothing makes sense. So, <clears throat> and, and honestly, any human would have said, I'm not going to, why would I buy in Live Nation? I'm going to short that. But when the Fed in, in was injecting liquidity into the market and in increasing the money supply from $4 trillion to $8 trillion in about a year or maybe 18 months, um, everything went up, right? And so we're trying to show that um, it's not because of fundamentals these stocks went up. It's because um, the Fed's been injecting liquidity. It's capitalism with government intervention, as Ayn Rand said, which is the worst type of economic phenomenon. So then what, what's the solution to this? Like now this has played out to such a large degree. Now we're seeing the bank failures. How does someone proceed from here and how does someone make sense of it for their personal finances? So I'm, I'm glad. So there's only two classroom scenes we have in our movie. Um, the first one is um, stocks are worth infinite, right? The second one is um, the professor is going to raise the book, the, the Efficient Market Thesis, and he's going to laugh. He's going to say smart people thought the world was flat once too, right? And then he's going to say the most underused books in finance are history books. And he's going to talk about the, um, the great German inflation from 1921 to 1924. 
he's then he's going to talk about um, how von Habenstein, the head of the central bank in Germany at the time, had a choice: print the money or trigger the revolution. Right. So SVB Bank went went um, bankrupt about ten days ago. Um, that was our print the money or trigger the revolution. Um, that was the moment. Right. So all of a sudden you've seen money. And by the way, we predicted this. Right. We knew this was going to happen because it always ends this way. Um, a fiat currency always ends this way. They, there's no choice. It comes down. To, Lord Acton had a quote. History always comes down to a battle between um, the people and the banks. And here we are. So they have a choice of either saving the banks or saving the, the people. Um, and they will always choose the banks. So what, what they did when, when, when SVB went bankrupt, they injected liquidity back into the market, right? So money supply went from $8 trillion on the balance sheet. They, I think they might have driven, driven the, um, the U.S. balance sheet down to $8.2 trillion um, from 8.8. .8. And then in like three days, they went from 8.2 to 8.5 because they provided liquidity. They're going to have to print the money or trigger the revolution. But if they print the money, U.S. could lose global reserve status, right? Because, because they're, they're showing you there's no option now. The crises keep getting bigger. <clears throat> in 1998, we had the, the tech bubble, which was contained to one sector, the tech sector. And then to get out of that, they drove interest rates down. They played the money game. They drove interest rates down. Um, and then all of a sudden in 2008, 2007, we had the uh, financial crisis, which all of a sudden it was much bigger than the tech bubble. Then in order to get out of that, they drove interest rates down to negative and, uh, and drove it up. But now, um, now we're sitting in a sovereign debt crisis. So the crisis keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what's the path out? Well, first of all, I would argue that the, the system right now is broken, right? So the, all, the, all the money is flowing to the rich. None of the money is flowing to the, the, the mid class and the, and the poor. So I would argue right now the system is broken. I would argue that if, if this system changes, the dollar system, which, by the way, is is um, all of the G7 working together. Because if you can keep currency strong, you keep commodities weak, right? And I have a chart, a 100-year chart, like 120-year chart that commodities now trading at 120-year um, low versus financial assets because they, they're keeping commodities uh, weak. By the way, what's the biggest commodity in the world? And I'll give everyone a hint. It's not oil. It's um, the biggest commodity in the world is labor. So if you can keep commodities, mm. um, currency strong, you keep commodities weak. And now commodities are the weakest they've ever been. So I would argue that if the dollar system uh, breaks, you're going to have a flourishing. The economy will boom. We'll start to allocate capital again, and the global economy will boom higher, right? Because all of a sudden, the system will start to allocate capital again. The system currently is broken. If the dollar system uh, collapses, the economy will boom. In Germany from 1921 to 1924, when their currency went to zero, their economy never changed. It was a transfer of wealth. Money flowed from creditors to debtors, to bondhold from bondholders to people who owned homes, because the bond the bondholders lost everything, right? But the economy yeah. never, the economy never changed. So the real economy didn't shift. It didn't. Yes, the currency collapsed, but the real economy never shifted because because it was whatever was left, right? There was a, there was a transfer. It was the biggest transfer of wealth in history. Um, and by the way, I think we might have another one of those. That's what I, th I see coming. Is that um, everyone would tell you. We're in an unsustainable path. I believe we're getting closer and closer. What I keep telling um, people that I talk to is that Money Game will timestamp the biggest currency transition in history because it's a break of the dollar system, right? At the end of Money Game, by the way, you will see a booming economy. So everyone thinks it's going to be negative. No. Factories return to the U.S. Uh, factories return to Europe, right? Because it's a global movie. Um, so you're going to see factories return. You're going to see economy grow. You're going to see um, capital being allocated correctly again. And the economy is going to boom. It's a positive ending. It's not a negative ending. Now, that said, politically, um, I would say there's a, there's, a, there's a risk. People say, well, Chris, why did you make Money Game? And I said, because I know how the movie ends. My coffee goes from $3 to $30. And all of a sudden, everyone blames the capitalists and turns to an authoritarian leader like Hitler to save them. And what I want to do is I want to change the ending. So I want them to blame the central planners and, and return to capitalism. If we can, if we can make that shift... And, and get rid of the central planners, Janet Yellen, uh, Jerome Powell. We will um, we can return to capitalism and we will have a booming economy, which again allocates capital correctly again. Because the system currently isn't. We're pouring trillions into GameStop, FTX, Dogecoin, all this crazy stuff. So yeah, the stuff that has no underlying productivity. So for anybody correct. who wants to be part of the real economy, you know, participate in assets that actually have productivity. Correct. 
And and honestly, you can buy companies. I mean, look at Petrobras trades at 1.5 times trailing free cash flow. Trailing, not future, right? Um, with a 70% dividend yield. YPF trades at 1.8 times earnings. It's an oil company in Argentina. Um, I own this company called Zim, Zim, which is a shipping company that earned $50 per share trades at, at last year, uh, not next year. But last year, and um, trades at uh, twenty-two dollars. Uh, they they just paid it for the quarter. They paid a six dollar and forty-seven cent dividend, a thirty percent dividend <laughs> for the quarter. And you and people are still telling you that markets are efficient, which gets back to qu- Professor Gardner's quotes: "Smart people thought the world was flat once too." Right. By the way, that's um, that's the symbol of Tappet. Um, Tappet is a T A P I T, um, and that's the symbol. And you guys can decide what you think that is. There, there it is. Um, so it's, it's a very entertaining movie. It's a drama. It's kind of like Goodwill Hunting meets The Wolf of Wall Street, right? It's rated R, um, sex, drugs. Um, we, we felt in order to get the message out, we wanted an incredibly entertaining movie. Movie People don't go to movies for lectures. There's only two, um, two classroom scenes, which is probably a total of eight minutes in the entire movie. You're going to be seeing the message because my director always says we want to show it. We don't want to say it. So show it. So we have, we have an hour and 40 minutes to show this. But and we don't want to sit anyone in a classroom. And if we're going to do a classroom scene, they have to be incredibly entertaining because we don't want to sit in classrooms, right? We want we want to yeah. show through, through the CEO of Tappet who making making billions. I think that's a hundred percent true. Nobody wants to be lectured. Everybody wants to be entertained. Correct. So if you can bring the lesson to the entertainment, that's Correct. where people pay attention. In some of it, some people miss a lot of it. They're going to have to watch it a number of times to to see the message. Um, but the messages are all in there. Um, and it's it's all clever, right? Using the, the big five from the Savannah was really smart uh, because people are going to be looking for the elephant and they're never going to see him unless they look at the lead character. So it's a real economy, <laughs> right? So um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a clever way to do it. But um, I will tell you, my actors, I, I couldn't be ha- happier with our actors. We have um, Daniel. Um, Daniel Washington was the was Whitney Houston's brother in, in I Want to Dance with Somebody. He's a great actor. He's a great lead guy. We came acro- across uh, Katie Lynn Johnson probably three weeks before we shot, who's the love interest in the movie. Beautiful, um, sweetheart, just the nicest person. I can't I can't wait to watch her become an absolute star um, because she's going to be a star. Um, but but so is Terrence McFadden and Naheem Garcia is the is the um, is Professor Gardner and he couldn't have done a better job. He has this voice. He has a voice kind of like Morgan Freeman. And you're going to keep see, hearing him um, over, over. You know, you're going to see here. You're, he's going to be making points the entire way. He's kind of like almost narrating it, um, but it's it's a podcast. It's his podcast. I'm excited about it. We'll see. You never know with movies, but I think we have the biggest topic in the world that we're discussing. Yeah, and the timing, I mean, it's just on point. You no, know? like we see everything on the melt right, right now as we're discussing it. As you. You know, the movie is getting ready to be published. So it's just phenomenal how you put it together in, in, in that right ecosystem of time and everything. And we did it before because you know how the movie ends. We all know how this ends. And, and you're seeing it now. SVB bank went bankrupt 10 days ago, right? That was our print the money or trigger the revolution moment. So now they're yeah. going to have to, unless they want to see the banking system collapse, they're going to have to print more money. If they print more money, it's going to cause more inflation. Right. So, um, so, and by the time this movie comes out, which probably September, inflation will be much higher, in my opinion. Yeah. So, so you're stoked. <laughs> the last 10 days, you're like, oh my God, we got it so right. I, yeah. I mean, I knew it was coming. Right now, if, if you take the true interest expense of the US, um, we're, I think we're about 120% of tax receipts. So we're already in that doom loop. You can't pay it. There's no way to, um, to pay the big three entitlements. Healthcare, uh, Social Security, interest expense. By the way, as interest expense goes up, um, they have to pay more on that, right? If we have thirty yeah. trillion, think about it. If we, the U.S. brought in four point five trillion dollars in tax receipts last year, if interest rates only went to ten percent, that's three trillion dollars in debt service alone. That doesn't yeah. include military, um, Social Security, and there, we also know there's no way to cut those big three expenses. I would argue those big big three expenses. Um, Medicare, um, you know, Social Security, um, military are um, are kind of like um, reparations in Germany from 1921 to 1924, where they were forced to pay for all these the war crimes that they they had. Right, so they had to pay off in order to pay off pay off, pay all those um, the countries that they went to war with off. They had to print start printing money. It's the exact same situation. So we're in a sovereign debt. Yeah. When the when the government assumes all the debt, I'm sorry, assumes all the risk, then it's the currency at risk. And that's where we are. 
right? They, there's no way. To, there's no way for them to get around it. There's no way if they if they drive interest rates up um, to protect the dollar, um, they're going to bankrupt themselves. Luke Roman makes this point. Luke Roman, who's one of the best economists, I think he is the best economist. He's from Forest Through the Threes. He says the strongest the dollar will ever be is the day before they default, <laughs> right? Because if they if they let the dollar get too strong, they'll default and the dollar goes to zero. Right. Another another point he makes is the um, the bull case for um, for bonds is that the um, the Fed uh, reverses course and starts printing money into the inflation. That's the bull case. The bear case is they default because they can't afford it. Right. Um, yeah. Larry Lindsay says governments will do anything they when when they get to this point. He, Larry, Larry Lindsay, the um, the economist, I can't remember which president he was under. He's one of the big economists. He says when the governments can't afford to keep themselves in business, they'll do anything they, they can. They'll use all available powers of the government um, to fund themselves. And he says, if we ever get there, um, it's going it's a very dangerous time. And I think we're there. That's why I say money game will timestamp the biggest currency shift in history. So you're, you're, you're personally seeing a positive outcome overall because it means we're um, moving back to productivity and real assets. And capital. But then at the same time. And yeah, capitalism. and capitalism. So right now you're not in capitalism. If this is a, now we could, we could go the other way. We could go into an authoritarian um, dictatorship, right? Anne Rand would tell you that we're going to go into an authoritarian dictatorship. When, you, when this type of thing happens, you go into authoritarian dictatorship. That's just how it goes, right? Um, I'm trying to change that, right? That's why I made the movie because I, I, want, I want everyone to know it wasn't the capitalists. Understand that um, during uh, Germany in 1921, they blamed the capitalists, right? The, the business owners uh, because their, their coffees went from $3 to $30. $30. So – I would argue if the, if the system collapses, it's a dangerous time because it's, it's when a political shift in, system can shift. And we just want to make sure it's a return to capitalism and not an authoritarian leader. Yeah. But, you know, the, the thing, what you just said is that when people see rising prices, they don't think of devaluation. They think of greedy business owners. Correct. But the business and that's that's business. something we're seeing today too. Like if I if I speak to people that are maybe not as interested in their personal finance or in finances in general, they they look at it and like oh everything is getting so expensive, and and they primarily think of it as the profits of the companies that Correct. they have to purchase from. Correct. And by the way, those those profits of those companies aren't profits. Amazon doesn't make a profit, right? Snapchat doesn't make a profit. There's no profit. It's a financing system. Right. So th there's no profit there. And the thing is that the, the um, humans would, would say, well, why would I buy a company that has no profit? But it's not humans anymore. The ecosystem change. It's machines. Right. And, and what in your opening quote in this whole thing, price is what you pay, value is what you get. The, um, the system is ha now has you following price. And by the way, um, Snapchat, as you noticed, went from what, five billion to 80 billion, like 100, 120 billion. They had negative gross margins. Forget about operating margins. Their gross margins were negative. Why was it going to 120 billion? And what, as if Snapchat is going to change our lives, people talk about well, technology is changing your life. Really? Snapchat's ruining people's lives. People are on wasting their time on this. It's it's yeah. growing productivity. It, it, it takes productivity out of the system in so many ways. First, it distracts people that could <clears throat> be productive, and then it uh, disallocation of capital to something that's not productive. Right. So it's, it's just, it's just creating it's, but, but people say, well, technology is changing the world. Not really. Snapchat ruining the world, right? It's not helping the world, but they, they'll lump it under technology. Well, it's a technology company. Therefore it's got to be good for the world. No, smart people thought the world was flat ones too. Like you, you really, it's just groupthink, right? What you're seeing is the biggest financial groupthink in world history um, that markets are efficient because you're all seeing they aren't. By the way, our closing quote in the movie is this, it's from Jack Bogle. He's the founder of, um, of Passive Investing at Vanguard. And in 2017, he said, if passive ever gets bigger than active, you'll have chaos and catastrophe. Our markets will fail. What you're seeing today is that markets are failing. They're failing to allocate scarce resources efficiently. And yet the PhDs from, um, from University of Chicago are still um, using price movement from a manipulated system to measure efficiency and not the, not the, um, the, the impacts it has on the real economy. The real economy isn't growing. That's the elephant in the room. And I think that's a country, oh no, that's an issue many countries have. Like if, if I look at the West and especially you, you keep mentioning Germany, if I look at Germany, I, I think like there is less and less willingness to be productive. 
right. there's less and less efficiency in the regulatory system to be productive. And there's more and more hurdles overall. And if I, like, I, I mean, I, I don't have that understanding, but I look at it and I'm like, I don't think this is going to play down well. And at the same time, they have, uh, they don't have immigration in the way the U S has. So, uh, they're just becoming an older population that to some degree becomes less productive, has more strains on the system through their own hurdles and expectations of uh, what's happening. So over the next 20 years, I'm, I'm anything but bullish on the German economy. Well, there's no, there's no, um, there's no reason to be productive because your, um, your, your, your assets are trading infinite. Like you're trading at companies, you're looking at your state statements in your portfolio and saying, well, I'm worth a lot of money. I don't, there's no reason for me to go to work. I have all this money. What they're doing, what they're, by driving assets to in, asset prices to infinite, they're basically funding their, their people. Right. Um, but it's it's taking incentive out because I don't need to work. By the way, you don't need to work. But the other thing that's very interesting is the real economy assets have never been cheaper. Like I can buy oil companies. I mean, YPF got got down to it, it hit its low. It hit one point one billion dollars. It's a, it's the biggest oil company in, in Argentina. It hit one point one billion for the quarter. They generated eight hundred million in free cash flow. Their earnings were eight hundred million for the quarter and it got to one point one uh, one point one billion. So you're paying about 0.3, 0.4 times earnings. How can that be? Like, it doesn't make sense. I mean, like um, U.S. Steel, by the way, a real asset, um, got to probably uh, maybe one and a half, two times free cash flow on last year's earnings. People are believing that markets are, are, are um, calculating what the, what the discounted cash flows and all that. But think about Amazon. They lose $40 billion. Are there really people making those adjustments? I mean, is, is Amazon not to scale yet? It's the third biggest company in the world. Are they not up to scale that they can actually make a profit, right? It's the third biggest company in the world. Is, is that rational that they're going to grow into their profit at some point? Or is it just not a profit, profitable company? Is it kind of like the post office that doesn't make money? Why, and why does Amazon trade? Was, why was it trading at $2 trillion? It still trades at 1.4 or something like that. Why? Because it's not people anymore. The ecosystem changed, right? So no, no human would buy that. So what you're basically also saying is that someone who actually sits down and puts a pen to the paper and yeah. thinks about the productivity of the underlying fundamentals of companies can do very well in this environment. So what I say is that the, um, if you understand that markets are broken, you're holding a crystal ball because all you need to do is think. I want you, what we want to, at the end of this movie, we want to um, create lions. We want to bring back the lions. So think about this. Imagine reintroducing a herd of lions back into the savanna after the gazelle population had exploded 10x and is thirsty and weak. Well, they will slaughter the population and, so and they, explode their own population. The lion. Till there is a balance again. The lions would make a killing. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create lions again. We're trying to get the population to think. Right. Don't pour, put your money in with these um, with the passive investing, with the uh, the quantitative managers who aren't thinking and don't have your best interest. Those people won. Those 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 machines won because they have no morals. Not because. And all you need to do is think. If you think and you can you can go buy. And once you understand markets are broken, you're holding a crystal ball because you can go buy um, Petrobras right now with a 70 percent dividend yield. Right. And, and it's oil. It's real assets. And by the way, that's during an inflationary cycle. Right? We all you, you know, where do you live again? What country? In New York. You're in New York. OK. Um, but if you look at Europe, there's an energy crisis. So you can buy oil. I mean, look at the U.S. oil companies. You can look um, buy Vital uh, for one point eight times trailing freak, trailing earnings. OVV, uh, Ovintiv uh, for three times earnings. Um, there's, there's so many, even U S companies. you don't have to go to international, go to the U S companies. There's plenty of U S companies that are dirt cheap, not the big ones, the big ones that are in indexes like Exxon 10 times earnings. Okay. That's, that's probably fair. It's probably, it's probably worth a little more than that. But during a, a, um, sovereign debt crisis where there's risk to the value of the, of the dollar and the, and the currencies, you can buy real assets cheaper than, I mean, thing, I can't believe you can buy them with it where you can buy them. And so if you, if you, once you understand markets are broken, just go buy real assets in the, um, in the movie, um, James is going to say, what should a guy like me do? And he's talking, he's talking to professor Gardner at a bar, professor guy, but Gardner says, buy real assets. They've never been cheaper. They're trading at 120 year low versus financial assets. What do you mean? Copper, gold, silver, um, steel, anything. And then, uh, James says, how about lumber? Um, and professor Gardner says, yeah, that works. Of course, then James buys a lumber operation and makes a fortune. Funny that you mentioned lumber. I was literally thinking of sending an entire 
shipload of lumber to Europe last year as the uh, energy crisis out, all played out and, and the lumber prices went through the roof here. But it, it, I was looking at the regulations around uh, the import of lumber itself and the ship and everything. And it, it, in that particular moment, it didn't make sense for me to, to do it. Totally. But I was, I was like, for, for us, like this, this makes perfect sense. We, I have reasonable price lumber here. They have like crazy prices over there. I just need to get it there in time. 100%. And I mean, you can buy the lumber companies in the US for, again, uh, of course, the prices were a lot higher. When lumber prices probably have averaged over the last 10 years, $250 per whatever they measured in. Um, it, at its peak, it hit um, 1600 Right, and the lumber companies were making a fortune. Now it's probably back to four four fifty. It's still doubled from its from its average over the last ten years, uh, but it's only probably five hundred now. Um, so it's 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 come back in. But I, I would argue that at some point, the 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 second biggest line in the entire movie um, is um, Von Havenstein had a choice: print the money or trigger the revolution. Von Havenstein's the the head of the central bank in Germany. And so that's the second biggest line. And that's what I would argue when SVB Bank went bankrupt. That was our Lehman moment that the government has to print the money or trigger the revolution. So we're at now at that point. So we're, we're at that point uh, that they're going to have to um, make a decision. Um, do you choose the banks? Do you choose um, defending the dollar or do you choose um, inflation? And they're going to choose inflation. They always choose inflation because they because they're going to do everything within their powers to um, to um to um, fund themselves, as Larry Lindsay said. So how does it play out for like the U.S. being kind of the, the guiding star in the world? I mean, this very much sounds like we're at the shift of power here when it comes to world reserve currency. And I mean, once the world re uh, reserve currency shifted, power shifts too. 100%. So balance of payments equals your current account minus your capital account, plus or minus your balance account, your capital account. So you know the U.S. has run a, a um, current account trade deficit for 40 years. So how do they balance that? How does the currency not collapse? If you run a, a, um, a currency, a current account, a trade deficit for, for, forever because the capital account was positive. So people were funding U.S. business. So the, so the world was buying U.S. dollars, U.S. dollars, U.S. bonds, um, U.S. stocks, right? So if you look at the amount of money that's poured into the U.S. in the capital account, in 2007, it was probably 5% of U.S. GDP. It was probably $2 trillion. It's probably 5 or 6% of GDP. Today, it's, it's $18 trillion dollars is the amount that's flowed into the capital account over the last 40 years. But 18 trillion is now about 80% of US GDP. So what happens if all of a sudden the US loses global reserve status? All those $18 trillion of bonds, um, stocks, and they set f flow out, you can't balance your current account and your capital account. If your capital account, all of a sudden money starts flowing out of US assets, you can't balance that quickly, the current account. So all of a sudden, in order to balance your balance of payments, it has to be the currency that falls. And that's where we are. So what I would argue is the end of the dollar system. That's what you're looking at. So historically, you know, we we're talking about risk-free rates when we borrow money or we give money to the, the government rather, and uh, we, we get interest on that. But the environment you're describing right now sounds anything but risk-free. Well, so it's, um, I would say it's return-free. I would say it's, I, I would say it's the opposite. It's return-free risk. So you're taking tremendous <laughs> amount of risk. Well, think about it. Think about it. Debt, debt has gone. Um, why has debt gone up? In, in 1980, um, U.S. debt under Volcker, um, interest rates were 18% and debt was 30% of GDP. Debt has gone up to 125%. Interest rates went to negative. Does that make sense? Like as debt went up, as you took more risk, interest rates went down because they were playing yeah. the money game. They were controlling interest rates, right? You, you have um, um, Richard Fisher, I think it was, who said that um, the Fed's been controlling interest rates. I have a quote, right? Fed's been controlling. Res if interest rates go up, it'll cause a lot of problems. I can't remember exact quote, um, but he, he's telling you we're controlling interest rates. That's the money game, right? And by the way, it gets back to Professor's, Professor Gardner's biggest quote. Correct. And when the Fed intervened in bond markets in 2008, it broke the ecosystem. So we're living in a particular period of time. Um, I think it's one of the most epic periods of time. People don't even realize it. Like who would ever buy a bond with a negative yield from a country that's monetizing its debt? Think about it. Um, you're going to give me hundred dollars. At the end of the year, I'm going to give you back ninety-eight. On Wall Street, they call that negative interest rates. On Main Street, they call it theft. Right? Who would buy a bond with a negative yield? And by the way, the U.S. can't afford. Think about it. What is inflation? Eight percent, seven, eight percent. So if they go to ten percent, it's going to eat up seventy-five percent of just the interest alone. Because we have thirty thirty-two trillion dollars in debt, and we bring in four point five trillion in in tax receipts. So if interest rates went to ten percent. A, a positive 3% yield. Our finances are dead. 
they can't afford to pay positive rates right now. So all they can do is jawbone and tell you we're going to we're going to we're fighting inflation. Think about that. The Fed was created in 1913 to prevent deflation. That what what the, what the Fed is is a um is a um is a printing press. They're telling you they fight inflation. That's funny. Their job is to create inflation. That's their only job. Their pro- their their whole job is to prevent deflation. That's why they exist to prevent deflation. That's why I say they will they will have to print the money or trigger the revolution. And by the way, notice right now what's happening. The banks have made all these loans at three percent for thirty years, but now deposits are five percent. Or I'm sorry, the uh, the bo- the interest rates on short term interest rates on short term government bonds are five yeah. percent. Deposit rates you probably you're going to go to a bank. The deposit rates are going to be three percent, maybe three and a half. I don't know what it is, but um, they're losing deposits because the U.S. need for funding or U.S. Um, debt service is crowding out the banks. They're crowding out their own banking system. So the, the banks are forced to either pay 5%, which is more than they're receiving from their from their um, their loans, or lose depositors. And right now, there's a run on banks like there's never been since 1980, the biggest run on banks since then. And they're going to tell you the system's safe, right? But FDIC only covers, I think, $170 billion of the $17 trillion of deposits that are out there. So there's only yeah. I, I kind of describe that as a um a game of musical chairs. You have ten you have twelve people playing musical chairs, right? SVB grandma lost, but she got saved. So everyone said, Oh grandma, it's okay, you get saved. And the two hundred people in the in the stands went, Woo, yay, grandma gets saved. Then the, the the PA announcer said, By the way, the next round, all two hundred and eleven people in the room are now in the game. Here we go. Because 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 they because they can't save everyone. Yeah. So that's what you're getting. You're getting a, a run on the bank. Yeah, I mean, the saving in itself breaks the system at large. Like if you truly say, hey, now it's risk-free and you try, you, you make that promise, you, you basically break the system in itself. Well, that's right. I mean, they have, they have no option now. Print the money or trigger the revolution, right? Because if they don't print the money, the banks are going to fail, right? So we're at that moment. So it's history repeats and that's where we are. And that's why I wanted to make the movie because I know how the movie ends, right? It, moves, it, it ends with much higher inflation. That's where it's just where we are. I just want to, I just want the system to return to capitalism and not um, go towards the uh, authoritarian leader. But you're right. That's what, that's what they're going to do. They're going to blame uh, the capitalist again because uh, you're seeing it right now. Oh my God, my coffee is really expensive. I can't believe these guys are charging me this. Okay, they're just trying to make a profit. And by the way, most of them aren't making profits. They're still losing money. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is something we we th- see through everything. I mean, my. My parents have been business owners for, or my family has been business owners for over a hundred years. And the first thing is always like, oh, why, why do you make things more expensive? I'm like, well, we're just part of a supply chain here. Like we're also just trying to keep a meager profit margin. You know, we're not making killing here. Right. The people that are making a killing, think of the unevil, of uneven playing field you're seeing. So <clears throat> we're going to show it in Money Game. They'll go to a Shake Shack. It's close. It, it, nobody's, nobody's in there. Right. But then they go to, but, but the stock's doubling. Right. On the other hand, they go to a mom and pop in the real economy. That's their favorite mom and pop. And it's closed because they have to make profit and they can't make profit. So the professor, professor of the gardener is going to say um, in the movie, the Fed is supposed to be like a referee in a football game. No one's supposed to notice them. But now they flipped the field 90 degrees and broke the scoreboard because what's happening is all the all, all the power is, is shifting to publicly traded companies. Um, and so you're, it's, it's an uneven playing field now. So if you're publicly traded, your live nation the stock went to hunt, uh, doubled from its peak or Shake Shack went to $4 billion, even though they lose money and their same store sales for every every new um, new um, restaurant they put out there is negative. So there's no demand for more Shake Shacks, right? But the stock's trading at 150 times free cash flow, 150 or even more. They I think they even lose money. So you're show, showing that there's two different systems now that are competing against each other. They're not, they don't work together. The financial economy and the real economy no longer work together, right? They're actually competing against each other. It's an unequal playing field. It's not fair to everyone, yeah. right? So this system right now is broken and unfair. And that's why you're seeing all the money flow to the rich. If we return to yeah. capitalism, it would be a equal playing field and the economy would boom higher because you'd have, you provide incentive again to compete. Well, Chris, this has been quite a download on what's happening and also on your movie. Thank you so much for making the time. Where can people find out more about the movie and yourself and the actors involved? So honestly, I would go to LinkedIn. I would just connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Chris Galizio, G-A-L-I-Z-I-O. If anyone wants to connect me directly, you can go to my email. It's cgalizio 
at Comcast.net. It's G-A-L-I-Z-I-O. Um, and I'll get back to you. I'm just a regular guy I'm trying to fix the system. And that's, that's my, um, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. This has been super informative, interesting. And I think uh, if someone isn't really thinking about what's happening next after this conversation, then I don't know what will help them. Thanks, Hannah. It's a nice, nice chat with you. And give, thanks for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak in your podcast. Thank you for joining us at The Path to Wealth. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Check out our upcoming guests and be sure to share it with all your friends and family that want to take their life to the next level of wealth.